Welcome back, folks. So we've been away for a while, uh, looking after my mum and getting this ship ready for sale. Uh, so we decided instead of crossing the Atlantic, I'd get all the bits and pieces sorted while we're here in Panama. And I'm, I'm surprised actually, we've got uh, from some of the off-grid places we've been, there's definitely some very good skill set here. Uh, so I'm gonna take you through some of the things in this video. Now, you may not be interested to buy a Neil 51, particularly this one. Uh, if you wanna buy a Neil and you're in the 50 category, uh, this one's obviously up for sale, so save yourself the long waiting list. Um, and this is obviously a seaworthy ship, and I've spent a lot of time and effort getting the, uh, a production boat to a, a production exploration vessel. So you've got basically a limousine that is ready for offshore uh, sailing and off-grid living. So let me show you around. You might learn something, even so, you know, even if you're not interested actually in buying one. You might learn some stuff because I'm going to do a little bit more of a tour inside. So anyway, stay tuned and see what we've got for you. So starting off, let me just show you. Uh, I actually added this table in Guatemala. And I took the parts of the original uh, laminate table and we made out of teak and then a lacquered teak with epoxy. So it's, it's durable, um, but what I would say is to you folks that are thinking, should I spend uh, more money on um, a high performance boat with lots of lacquer trims? It looks great in a marina, but the problem is you have to maintain it. And so what that means is you're gonna have to start either getting people to come on board and maintain it for you. Uh, so you wanna think long and hard about actually how much lacquered furniture and stuff and cabinets you really want. There's the other drawback, which is in the tropics, too much wood attracts termites. So again, it's actually quite a shrewd thing to have that laminate uh, um, that's, that comes from the factory around a lot of the place. But for me, it's just quite nice having a little bit of luxury uh, to sit and eat your food at. So you may, may notice, you know, there's obviously some of our personal items and bits and pieces because we're still living on board. Um, but I wanna show you something um, that you may not have noticed. This large bag behind me is my ditch bag. And you know, I just leave it there all the time because if somebody were to move out and there was an emergency, a ditch bag, let's remember, is the things that you wanna take with you. The only thing that isn't in my ditch bag that I highly suggest that you get into the habit of putting in a, um, a Ziploc bag are your personal documents, such as your passport and driving license and visas. Because I can tell you, you've already, imagine the scenario where you, you've got into an accident, you've lost your boat, you're in your lifeboat, you get on shore and now you've got to go to the embassy and get your passports and everything. Just a nightmare. So don't forget to, to hold on to those passports for dear life, like your own life. This, this kind of stuff, you wouldn't um, necessarily find that easily uh, or know necessarily what to find. So I've been living on board for a while now and I've started to collect some things that I think are quite important that you might not necessarily have thought of. So I'm just going to go briefly through some of these things and show you. There's that old trusty knife. If you looked at my previous videos, this is the cookery style knife from um, it's now His Majesty's uh, Royal Gurkha Rifle Regiment. Um, and again, this is this is a handy, handy uh, blade, not too heavy, really nicely balanced. Um, it's from the CRKT website. It's called, um, let's see, uh, A Chance in Hell. <laughs> it's called A Chance in Hell. So that's a good one. Highly recommend it. It's, I cover it in sprocket grease just to keep it not, doesn't let it get too blunt, the sea salt. Now inside, we've got a whole load of things. I think you'd be surprised if I didn't have a first aid kit as a medical doctor, that's my background. Having a first aid kit is critical. Now this is just a small one. I've got a, a, a large pharmacy on board actually of, of bits and pieces. And for example, recently a young child um, came on board with nail infections and I try and help out as we go along. And you, you'll be surprised, actually, train, like, like all these things, listen, the best investment you can make is in yourself. And so, you know, knowledge about how to put in an, an IV line, how to base, do some basic suturing. Um, you know, if you get a chance to practice that stuff before and you're thinking to do what I do, which is go well off grid, I, su I suggest you, you know, take a, take a bit of time while you're, before you start an adventure like this and think about how can I educate myself before I go away. But first aid kit, pretty standard. I've actually got a, a suture kit here. Um, you know, I've got some a basic scalpels and you know, forceps and basic forceps, stuff like that. 
Um, another nice one, solar grid array. So handy, good charge. If you're in your life raft, you can have a, have a good chance at charging you know, your radios and some of your equipment. Handy piece of kit. I've got a lot more of it around, pl planted around the boat and dotted around the boat in different places. But just, you know, some, some fresh water, you, you know, that, that's going to go as soon as you open that bag and you're, you're in the, you know, in the life raft, you'll probably be want to drink some water. Uh, you know, obviously the adrenaline and the whole experience, you'll be thirsty anyway. So there's a load, I have a lot of it dot, dotted around the boat in various strategic locations. Now, let's remember, when this boat is turned upside down, um, you're going to have, still have fresh water in the tanks. So remember, folks, you're always going to try your, your longest to stay with the main ship, even if she's overturned or whatever. You want to stay around the main ship. Your chances of survival are significantly increased. Don't get your tin food, you know, the water, um, and, you know, you'll be able to ju maybe jury rig something. So stay with the main ship. Got a pretty, pretty light waterproof coat can come in handy, you could use that for collecting some water. And I backed up, the life raft has one of these in it, and this is a solar still. I bought an extra one because they're not that productive, um, but better than nothing. So the solar still, it's pretty, pretty easy instructions on how they work. And obviously I'm in the tropics at the moment, so there's plenty of sun. Do those. One of the biggest additions that I've added to this bag is hand hand pump water maker. Now this is a bigger one, and this adds quite a significant weight. There, there is a little bit of a debate about whether or not you include one of these at all in your ditch bag. Uh, my view is I would at least like to have the choice, and I'll tell you why the the discussion what the discussion is about. Some of the hand pressure systems that make water are um, going to expel your energy. And so there's a debate around, are you spending more energy trying to make water and losing water in the process and using up your calories? So I would personally like the choice. I think if you're going to spend long times at sea and there's not rain, which at the moment there's a lot of in the tropics, but you can imagine it would be nice to have the choice, right? This stays in the ditch bag and it's designed to stay in your ditch bag. So it's a, a sea survival uh, a manual, and there's some recollections about how other people survived at sea. Um, now, obviously, this all seems a bit extreme, but it's better to have it, right? That, you know, should you get yourself in that situation, it's better to have it. And it, excellent, it's an excellent book. So obviously, I've added to the ditch bag. Yep. The obvious things are long-lasting nuts. Nuts are very high in calories bit of a nut mix there. And I've shown you in previous videos, it's a good old chicken tikka masala um, meal ready to eat. That stands for, MRE is the acronym that's used for these, um, you know, Boy Scouts, military type people call them MREs, which stands for meal ready to eat. So you can eat that hot or cold, better warm, right? Uh, but yeah, either which way you're gonna get the calories in. I've got another one here, this, this is actually a splint. It, you know, it can be used uh, just to uh, um, immobilize a fracture. And you don't know how long you're going to spend at sea, so part of the first aid survival kit. Some more MREs. Yeah. Yeah little water strobe, when this gets in contact with water, it, it'll activate the light. And so this stays on the, on the handles of the bag. Yeah? So when the, when the bag touches water, obviously, it makes it easier. If it were, were nighttime, I would be able to source the bag floating in the water or whatever. So uh, that's a little strobe, basically. Just put that over the side here. Another one, nice Gerber knife. This one's good for uh, slightly Everybody knows what those, those hooks are for. It's obviously for gutting animals, but having, having another two knives that are ready to go, and th these are quite sharp and they stay sharp, but don't use those that much. I save them for this ditch bag. Another one, I'm, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but these are called Israeli dressings, uh, to me anyway. And basically what they are, they, 
they apply pressure to a wound themselves on their own. So personally, you know, obviously with my background, I think these are better, uh, better dressings, particularly when I was a solo sailor. My, I couldn't, I wouldn't have been able to manage anything uh, if I were trying to apply pressure to a wound. So I couldn't sail the boat at the same time if I got a big gaping wound. It'd be nice to add a bit of pressure to the dressing as well. So those are great. Orange smoke signal. So these are quite interesting. So what the purpose of these re mostly are for is obviously attracting attention. But if you're uh, planning a helicopter, somebody's gonna come and pick you up from the helicopter, you drop that in the water and it helps the, uh, the pilot and the helicopter uh, see which way the current is, is drifting and the, and the boat is drifting itself. Um, but they obviously, are, you know, they attract a lot of attention as well. I've heard it said that actually, unfortunately, the orange color attracts sharks, but we'll have to re research that one for yourself. But either which way, I think if the helicopter's close, I'll probably, probably try and get his attention. Little can opener, just a little can opener for the, the cans that you might floating around. Handy, obviously a lighter. They don't work very well when they're um, when they're wet, you know, the flint doesn't work very well, but it's up to yourself how much you want to invest in this. Um, obviously, you know what those for? Handheld orange smoke signal. So, orange smoke. Another one, this, this, another one, obviously, insect repellent, just make things a little bit easier for you. You know, you've got insects, if you were on a beach or whatever, the, you know, the sand flies and mosquitoes, if you were stranded on the beach, could be pretty brutal. Um, I've got loads more water in here, folks. Um, the other thing is that batteries, uh, again, in a, in a, I've kind of taken most of the air out of this bag, but some has entered again, but batteries are always helpful for your radio. So loads of batteries, folks, handy. Little light stick. Now these are, these are those typical ones you see, you know, people messing around with. Little light sticks that you crack crack open and close and then use them. Just a handy, another additional light. This I've shown you uh, a little bit before. Now th this is called uh, a pack light and it's, it's the same stuff as on your, on your watch hands of, of, a, you know, of a watch to see in the dark. But what is really useful about these is you can, you can see some basic you know, illumination and you can find them, you know, they have them in emergency lights. But there's another trick if you have a, a torch, an LED torch with you, what you can do is you can extend the battery life of that torch by quickly shining it on one of these, all right? Switching off just for a second, a powerful torch switching on that, and you now have a very bright light for a good five minutes off that. So you see my point, you can extend the life of your batteries on your flashlight or your torch by just quickly flashing on that. One of the other things I've done is I've upgraded the you know, the navigation equipment and all the electrical equipment on board. You've seen that in previous videos. But while I've been here in Panama, I can, I can receive some packages and I've designed something I, th I personally believe quite unique. But the key is that it's one, robust, and two, the parts, if they break, I can replace them very cheaply. And I can just replace them by walking into a, a normal computer store. Everywhere has computers now but not everywhere has uh, marine navigational equipment. So let me show you. I've just basically taken a normal, normal mouse and I can, it's only a few, a few dollars for the mouse. And this is a waterproof keyboard, all right? And this TV was originally, um, you know, I installed this and it's a 42 inch TV. And remember, you don't want too big a TV because it's gonna eat your battery power, okay? And behind it, um, I've added this fan, it's a fanless uh, PC. Um, so it doesn't have any moving parts and it's a closed system. And, and actually I've tested it for a while now, it's quite robust. And again, I'm using this OpenCPN setup. And let's remember, with my OpenCPN at the nav station, so this is in the saloon. In the nav station, I'm sending out all that information on a Wi-Fi network and, and taking that information anywhere on the boat. So with a strong Wi-Fi router, a Wi-Fi 6 router, I can get radar, and all my wind instruments all across the boat, be it lying in bed, anybody can jump on it, even with their telephone, right? So if you have guests on board, they can actually get access to all that information themselves. Now, let's just remember, 
If you want to have radar overlay on top of your charts like you see here, generally what you have to do is buy a radar and a chart plotter of the same brand. Well, not anymore, because at the moment I'm running OpenCPN with a B&G Halo 20 radar. And so I get the beauty, the benefits of the excellent quality uh, B&G Halo 24, or 20, sorry. But I don't particularly like the chart plotters. So now I can, I can you know, pick and change between the cherry pick, basically, the, the bits of equipment across the, you know, the marine sector that I think are robust and I like. So for those lazy days when it might be raining outside or perhaps there's no wind and you're waiting around, you can take the strategy of this lady all the time and you can, you know, pick up a book. It's nice to have a library. Um, obviously, these, it's a personal choice, my books and my library, but you'll notice there's a couple of little things in them. There's these little little video game uh, drops. I thought they're quite cool, little pieces of kit that you can stick your telephone in and, you know, start playing video games if you're bored. And it's great for kids on board. It keeps the kids occupied. But besides toys and having fun, there's my e-pad and um, I obviously have a set of radios which I've shown you in other videos and you know having those charged is obviously pretty important but if you have them have them out it'll remind you to charge them so remember before you set off on any long passages you want to do my wobble checklist you remember and part of the wobble was the E for electric electronics right um, so you just want to make sure all your things are charged and everything's working so I'm just gonna navigate round Elba at my feet here and show you that actually all of this, all of these white cabinets you see all hold something. And I use it personally as a, as a dry pantry, you know, and uh, canned goods and got a bit of pasta and whatever. I have to say, it's one thing on this boat that you will never ever have a problem with, which is storage space. And, you know, you've got to remember a lot of the, the videos out there, people are kind of looking and see how much stowage there is, you know, taking it a bit too far in my opinion. I think a lot of the stuff you could cut it back because let's remember on multi-hulls, you're going to try and keep at the multi-hull weight and you'd be surprised all these things start to add up weight for cruising. So think long and hard about what extra weight you're going to add. Um, but, you know, the things that you seem are essential, which obviously food is. Uh, I, would give, what, I would say that you don't want to be buying too many condiments and things that you don't really eat. So keep a checklist of the things that you regularly eat. There's things that you might see and want, but you might not eat them. So when you're going shopping, that'll become part of, that should be part of your routine, seeing, keeping, keeping tabs of what stock you have and what you're actually you know, using and eating up. Before we leave the library part of the saloon, I just wanna say something that isn't a very apparent to people. Books, books are a great place cockroaches to lay eggs in the spine so again I've taken the time to use insecticide on the spine and you know spray the books to make sure that the cockroaches you know can't you know grow and and, and spread across your boat when you get a cockroach in a boat um, you know it's a bit unsightly of course but you know you must deal with it immediately uh, using insecticide luckily we haven't because you know prevention is the best cure all right, so the other thing is while I'm over here, I just want to show you, we've got one of those Dyson Hoovers and I've put a mirror in the corner here and the mirror's fixed in very nicely. But the Dyson Hoover, especially when you have a dog, I have to say we've been through, I think since I bought this boat, we've been through about four different Hoovers and the only one that survived is uh, Dyson. I'm proud to say that it's British as well. Lord Dyson's probably one of my heroes from product design perspective. And uh, yeah, product's great. Morale on board is, is very related and dependent on this area that I'm standing at. If you're at sea, you take pleasure, much more pleasure, in preparing your food and seeing everybody enjoy it. It's, I can't describe to you when you're offshore, uh, baking fresh bread, um, you know, deciding wh what you have in, in your galley and preparing beforehand and having the satisfaction of having that well set out meal. It's, it's a surprising increase in morale. But what is also very important in my view is good coffee. And this machine works both on 50 and 60 hertz. And this is an issue that nobody talks about. So this, this machine can do your cappuccino and um, you know, 
it's just lovely, basically, having that luxury. Obviously, it's a bit bigger, but the other thing is, I know it seems silly, but being able to, to, to go to your local area here, at the moment I'm in Panama, and buy local coffee beans and taste the local coffee is it's one of the pleasures, you know, especially it's the same with fresh fruit. You see Eva's got a, a nice pineapple behind me. And traveling in the tropics, just the food is just totally different, I, I have to say. And you, you folks also see it with tomatoes. Like you go down and you're living in inner city, the tomatoes just don't taste like tomatoes at all. But I can tell you, they taste great here. We have these two isotherm fridges and you know, they have a huge, huge back. There's loads of space, it's obviously our, our, our living goods in it, loads of space. One of the things I do is when we're offshore, we have a little a dish or a, um, like a pan that holds, you know, raw food. So the juices of the raw food are separated from the rest of the fridge. Um, that's, that's about the only thing really complex. I can go through some of the, the foods and stuff later, but there are some foods, we're not going offshore at the moment, but there are some foods that uh, last much longer. Things like cabbages, Brussels sprouts, onions you can see here, potatoes. Those things last longer. But for the first few days, you're probably going to be eating more salads uh, so the salads don't wilt. Uh, so salads, when you get back from a long passage, you really appreciate a salad. There's an interesting point. Um, some of my friends in Ireland, they, um, they sprout their own uh, vegetables like bean sprouts and other, other things like that um, to add to salads. So you get the pleasure of the flavors of salad offshore. So it's something you might want to think about. However, when you cross borders, uh, the biological quarantine folks, they, they don't like you taking soil from one place to another, and it's understandable. So pros and cons, depending, if you're staying within one country, you could probably think about doing your own sprouting or if you're offshore. Spices and cooking utensils are a bit of a personal preference, but I personally believe this this instrument, you know, these kind of um, stick blenders, really, really good. And uh, I would say, you know, there are kind of go-to pieces of a kit that that I keep. If it, if it isn't any good, basically, on board, just get rid of it because it'll just sit there. And you, you, in your house, you wouldn't do that. But on a boat, the clanging and rattling uh, gets a bit irritating if you get into bad weather when you're already going to be tired. So anything that we have on board, we use. And so that's a discipline that you must um, not hoard things. When you see people with stuff on, on you know, surfaces or in drawers that are clanging and rattling, it kind of kills the morale a little bit. So I, I've got, I bought this and installed uh, this small oven grill, but actually it's not that small. We can roast a chicken in this oven perfectly well and do a pan loaf of bread, no problem. And the beauty is because it's not too big, it doesn't take ages to heat up, and it doesn't use loads of energy off the inverter to heat up. So it does the job. So you might be surprised. You don't really need those massive ovens that you might find in your, in your, um, you know, your, your house kitchen, let's say. One of the other additions that we've, we've added uh, is this Bosch uh, four, four piece um, ho induction hob. And I don't use a kettle, uh, you know, offshore really uh, because it's nice, it make, if I don't have a kettle, it makes you think and plan ahead. And so Eva's got one over here. Eva's obviously Argentinian and, and drinks a drink called mate, which is a mild stimulant, handy. Um, but the fact that Eva drinks uh, this mate, she needs the hot water, obviously. So it makes you plan the hot water that you boil. So we use this deduction hob, boil all the hot water we need for a day and hold it in a thermos. And then you've got a hot cup of tea immediately when you go to it and you're not you know constantly running the generator and dependent on you know running the generator to get these hobs going and let's remember i also have for an emergency as a backup or on the beach if we're partying and, and just don't want to take the time to do a barbecue we have a multi-fuel burner which which burns um, gasoline or diesel uh, i think you can also burn paraffin in it too but yeah we have a multi-fuel burner which is quite a handy you know item to have just to set up uh, and boil some soup or something on the beach. Obviously, you know, it's, it's a matter of preference. A dishwasher on a boat like this, sure, it's great when you're in port and you don't have to do your dishes. Uh, you can get some tabletop dishwashers, 
uh, which use a little bit of water. Um, I don't know whether they've evolved. I've seen them. I've seen them around anyway. You can get tabletop dishwashers, but the full dishwasher, I'm not so sure whether you'd be wanting to add that weight. So having having the dishes out uh, and then cleaned and prepped and put away before you set off, I suggest doing that. But the other thing is, while we're here, the microwave is a, is a microwave and grill as well. Uh, I just used the microwave part of it, and it survived on 50 and 60 hertz. And that's the one from the factory, actually. Uh, works great. Uh, microwaving things, uh, particularly in bad weather. You know, you've, you've got your frozen meal ready. Just microwave it. If it's too bumpy and wavy, you, don't, you certainly don't want to be frying anything. But you'll notice that this, the stuff we have out now in the galley, generally we don't move it around so if we were to set off we could set off and go out to sea right now and things wouldn't be you know falling all over the place because it's you know it's such a stable boat it's it's more akin to you know a, a catamaran um, although it can sail upwind very well remember we have a freezer from the factory this is a i think this is a standard option in the uh, in the, the the 51 and you you can see it's, it's a normal chest style freezer, but there's absolutely, that's a, it's a deep freezer as well, right? So there's, you can see there's absolutely loads of space. So, you know, we've, if, we, if we pull in somewhere and, you know, you find good quality stuff, what you'll generally do is hoard up on it, put it in your freezer, and uh, then you have a bit of luxury offshore. So remember, for offshore passages, freezer space is something that it's always nice to have a lot of. In the past three months since uh, we've been, you know, fixing things, I've taken the time to do what is a very difficult thing to do, actually, and remove the pieces for, of equipment from a boat like that in the galley that I don't use or are not good or robust. And what I'm left with is a very stable, uh, robust system. And then I've added m whatever, you know, I require then afterwards. Uh, and at the moment, you can see that I'm getting uh, very reliable wind information from this Triton 2 from BNG. So I, I fixed up getting depth, getting all the usual goodies, and there's the autopilot as well. And I actually replaced the autopilot and I found that my old autopilot wasn't, um, although it was working fine, it was causing problems on my network. So it's quite an arduous process, trust me, even if you buy a new boat to commission these systems properly. And what I suggest you do is you know, watch some of my videos carefully and, and just either copy my setup or do something similar. At the moment, I'm running this. This is a Samsung S22 Ultra telephone, which is waterproof, by the way, uh, and, and an excellent telephone, and you can get one freely available. Remember, it's not just a telephone. It's more than that. It's basically a small laptop, and, and actually, I'm proving it here because I'm instead of buying, you know, a $6,500 chart plotter, I've got my, Sam, my Samsung telephone running to this, and it's waterproof, so I can just use the phone as a mouse. Look, just use that as a mouse. And um, here we are at the moment. And I'm actually, at the moment, as a backup, I'm just using the GPS of the, the telephone. But um, I can actually jump onto all my wind instruments and all the network from, from the telephone as well, and share all the, like, the depth readings and all that sort of stuff. So. You know, rather than spend an absolute fortune in a kit that doesn't work, this this is great. So this is um, it's actually I think a gaming uh, monitor, but this monitor has a battery in it as well. So should you switch off the inverter or switch on the generator and restart things, it stays on. Uh, it doesn't doesn't it's not really bothered by it. And you know you just charge the phone and it charges the um, you know the uh, the screen itself. Very handy. And at the same time, as you know, I'm a big fan of OpenCPN. And I've got the OpenCPN on the laptop, so I've got AIS. All all the core systems are running into that to that laptop, and that is my main laptop at the moment. And that's sending information to all the others. Uh, called that's called multiplexing that system. And what does that mean? Well, I'm not waiting for uh, a very unique part to tr cross an ocean where I'm going to pay a massive amount of duty for it. I can take literally any computer any computer and make it a navigational computer. And let me prove it to you. This is a Raspberry Pi, and this is a, this is a Linux-based computer. And you're wondering probably why I have this all wrapped up. This is my charts on a USB stick, and I have it all wrapped up, ready to go, and connect to that 
um, the screen, this battery powered screen. So should I be hit by lightning or have some catastrophic failure? I can now just simply hook this up and I've got another system ready to go. And this is a very low energy consumption. This runs off 12 volts, uh, this little um, Raspberry Pi. And I've tested it and, it and it's great. But what I would say is when it starts to get hot, it doesn't, doesn't like it for too long. So, you know, they're quite hard to get the Raspberry Pis now actually, um, because they're so popular over such, such a good price. So you can just get, um, I suggest either, if you want a, a Linux based PC, um, little pocket PC, you know, fanless PC is better. So no moving parts are better and, um, or, or just use a, a single board computer like the Raspberry Pi as your backup. Um, some people use it as your main system computer and I don't see any reason why not actually. Uh, if you're on a budget, go for it. Now I'm a fan of something else which I have to test a bit more extensively, um, but Garmin have bought a, com uh, a system called, uh, a company called uh, Vespa. And Vespa is a New Zealand based company originally I think and they created um, an AIS, but it's a very good cl uh, class AIS and um, a VHF and some other wizardry in the kit that will basically replicate much of what I've got up here. But anyway, for the moment, Carry On is working very stable and, and I'm very happy to, to sail offshore with her now. In fact, once we get everything sorted and we're happy enough um, you know, with all the bits before sail, we may just, myself and even might just sail to Columbia. This is an instrument from Calypso Instruments and it's a Wi-Fi solar powered uh, anonymator which does your wind. And I've tested it and it works with OpenCPN. So rather than running cables all the way down your mast, it's not, it's not as fast you know, as, as getting you a, a, a readout, but if you're stuck and you're in a pickle, you simply pop that on the top of your mast and it charges itself and you can pick it up on your telephone or you can get it on your OpenCPN. Handy, not having to run any cables, which is a real pain. It seems like a silly thing, but it's not. Again, it's about morale. This chair is a lazy boy. <laughs> it seems a bit crazy having one on a boat, but immediately you've now got another pilot berth. So you can be here at the alarms or you know relaxing offshore, keeping an eye on things, and it's quite relaxing. You know, you can keep yourself wedged in, relax, and even have a little snooze when you're in, in, in port. One of the very uh, good things about having a, a large nav station table like this is that I can also keep all my electrical equipment that I want to grab quickly so when we're coming in to anchor at night time I've got all my my how how high powered torches here with me and you remember from my previous videos a little bit messy at the moment but I've got you know my dive torches the waterproof torches and headphones so I don't keep everybody awake I've got a handy hatchet for breaking ice and, and taking care of those pesky pirates that might try and board you Go to things. This is an excellent piece of equipment, and I'll be taking this with me when I sail the boat. This is a thermal imaging um, Kalinox view. This is great because you can keep an eye on those pesky pirates and also see things that are in the water that you might not see. In fact, we've seen coming into anchor sometimes trees, full trees at night time coming in. I appreciate, you know, this, it is an expensive piece of equipment, but this one is one I've tested and, you know, you're going to spend quite a lot. It's from a company called Leica, which I think most of you folks will know that Leica are very famous for their, their very high quality glass. And, you know, if you're going to do it, I, I recommend this one, honestly, it's just a phenomenal piece of kit. What some people do is they add uh, a company called FLIR, F-L-I-R, and they add FLIR night vision and a stabilizer, a gyro stabilizer, uh, onto the ship systems. Uh, I, I, I wonder, you know, is it, is it maybe just better to have a handheld that you can have around your neck? And you can use it for other things as well. Obviously, if we go camping on the beach or whatever, you can have a look at the wildlife. And the gyro stabilizer might be an idea, but this boat is so stable under sail, it's not a problem. And we've seen... Uh, for one, one time, for example, uh, we caught a drift line, you know, a drift line, uh, which a pretty selfish, um, you know, long line in the middle of the ocean. We caught it on the rudder, and I could see it that we were catching it. And um, I'm not sure whether or not it actually had GPS on it because I noticed there were some some chaps following us in a lancha offshore. 
But anyway, with this, we managed to, to release the line and no longer were, were be followed because of the GPS unit on the, on the drift line. So you might want to think, if your budget um, can cater for it, I, I really like that one. I, I talked about binoc binoculars in a previous video, and because I, I love my photography as well, but I'm a big fan of Leica's stuff. And uh, I, I actually added to my, my repertoire another um, pair of binoculars. Remember the other ones were 20 times zoom, which I would have used uh, for, for sighting up targets. Uh, 20 times zoom is usually a spotting scope, and that's too much for its C. But these Leica ones, I think, are perfect. So they're in a 42 tube, and they're 8 times zoom. Um, and this is the brand. Like, I mean, that, if, with that combination, um, both day and night, you can use thermal imaging. Remember, it's not, it's not your old school green image that you're getting with the night vision. You're, you can use it both day and night. You're not going to damage the tubes. So binoculars, again, I appreciate, you know, it depends on your budget. But if, if, if you're going to spend money on anything, spend it on yourself and your education first. And then these kind of pieces of kit, as if you're going to spend time offshore, that, that can really, really help out. Trust me, worth spending some time and money on. Another one you might not have thought of, but these silly goggles, well, you get a lot of laughs if you go down the pub like this, but really helpful if you get a very strong squall and high winds. You can still navigate, see where you're going, and, and the orange lens kind of can make things come across a bit brighter. So not too expensive. If you like skiing or anything, you might have had one of those already uh, available in, you know, in, in, your, in your kit as well. You'll remember from my other episodes where I talked about also in a live stream, I talked about some equipment. There's a company called Ryobi, which does my drill. But I bought also what I recommend you, you do, and I've, I'm going to sell them with the, with the boat, is all the power tools. The, one of my torches, my flashlights, a very powerful one, uses the same battery pack as the power drill. So these things are important, um, and, and remember these, even if, you don't, if you're not interested in, in carry on, you know, if you're gonna buy a new boat, think about that. You know, go down and buy, choose one brand of power tools, and look at their catalog and see what things you think might be useful, because then you only have one charger, um, one type of batteries, uh, and then you're good to go. I have on my wrist something that I've been testing for a while. This is um, a Garmin Instinct watch, and it's a solar-powered watch, but it, it's quite incredible. If you just use it for, uh, there's, an, there's a mode in it called Expedition Mode, which as long as it gets a GPS fix, it can track where you've been and get you back to where you came from, but you can even put a, a waypoint to an approach in it. Uh, so you would get, give yourself a fighting chance, you know, if all your instruments failed or whatever. And of course, you can get a GPS signal if you lose, you know, your GPS, and then use a handheld radio. So redundancy and all these things. This this one is pretty good. I say, my my uh, previously I have another one which is 100% solar powered but doesn't have a GPS reception on it, and it's from Casio and it's called the Ga Casio Golfmaster. Um, I'm kind of torn between the two. On an offshore passage, this is good, but you know, from you know, for when I'm at anchor and daily, level, daily living, I have to say the Casio Golfmaster has never failed me. This eventually runs out of batteries after about a month, uh, and then you can charge it by leaving it in direct sunlight. But it's not quite as uh, you know reliable as the Casio Golfmaster. Something you might want to think about: these very you know posh diving watches. Uh, they're not really diving watches because for diving, you actually use a dive computer. And so I love it, it's, it's a watch and tells the time. This is actually a dive computer. And um, if you're gonna do any sort of diving, which we do a lot on Carry On, particularly because we, we, you know, we forage, right? And myself and Eva have seen some incredible things. And one of the things you'd wanna look at, apart from all the diving kit that we have on board, which comes for sale with Carry On, is the L&W compressor. And the compressor runs off the generator. And what that means is you can obviously charge your cylinders offshore. And as you start going further afield, other people might not have a dive compressor. So you could uh, ostensibly be kind or you could charge for, for um, you know, filling up people's dive cylinders. I'm at the nav station and next to the nav station in the center hull, these are the steps that go down to the center hull. 
and th this is what we next to me here. I have the day head, and I have obviously have a fully, fully contained cabin that's forward of the mast. And what that means is this cabin is the favourite cabin if you're going downwind sailing. It's super stable. So you know, if somebody wasn't feeling well or whatever, you're probably going to let them sleep and have a bit of a rest. Uh, in this cabin downwind. So remember, each cabin has a different advantage for different points of sail, all right? But what I wanna show you here is we have all our working water and fuel gauges. Um, and with, with Genset, you can test the Genset and the um, engine batteries by flipping the switch, and you can see they both got uh, 13 volts, which is great. And then we've got our direct current uh, DC 24. So this boat is a 24 volt DC. Uh, panel. So that's everything, physical breakers. And folks, my view, I'm not a big fan of digital switching at all. I, I know it's very snazzy to have digital switching like Alexa in your house and those kind of things on a boat, get struck by lightning and you have a nightmare. There's a very beautiful yacht here. Um, um, I won't even mention the model, but a very beautiful yacht. And they have things put all over the boat and they have digital switching and they got hit by lightning and they're they can't even start the engine or do anything. I can control everything very easily with just one physical trip switch. And then we have the 220 volt distribution, which uh, this is 220 volts, remember, because this is a European built boat. And in Europe, we have everything on 220 volts, right? The beauty of that is um, you'll notice in the United States as well, your, your home appliances are 110 volts but for, for things that require a lot of power, like a uh, mini split aircon in your house, you'll notice that you double up two live cables and make 220 volts. So it's quite handy, actually. Uh, we are basically in Europe on 220 volts, and it makes very little difference because when I put shore power in, uh, you, your shore power is usually catered for, w what we've done is 50 amp cables and 220 volts, and everywhere I've been so far has been able to cater for that. The onboard shore power charger can take 110 volts or 220, but again, it's better to have the 220 and you can double up. So there were adapter cables and everything that we could talk about at a later date, and I'll show you that outside. But anyway, we've got all our breaker systems here um, and it's really well labeled and not really had any problems with it. So sometimes what you might have is the thing that causes probably, I don't know, it's the most drain on power is this section, the white section, which is the air con and the air handling units, which are in each cabin, and then the compressors as well. You've got the compressors here. So at the moment, it's not too hot. And you know, I'm in the tropics here, remember? And we have a full air con system with two compressors on this boat. And it's so powerful that I actually don't even need to run two compressors. I just run one at the moment, and it saves you some energy. See if it's walking down the stairs. This cupboard holds all our foulies, our wet weather gear and life jackets and stuff like that. Uh, it's a very, it's a matter of preference what weight and what force of life jackets you want, but these will all come with carry on. There's no point. There's, I've got dry suits and everything realistically that you need for offshore sailing. I've got it. There's a, there's a day head in here. So this, uh, for if you have guests just coming for lunch or whatever, we would normally use this bathroom, this toilet, uh, for, you know, shower and whatever and the head itself. And there's also a pantry for dried goods and stuff. So there's storage there. We have, I've added, remember I said to you that for offshore sailing, having frozen food is always really helpful. And again, you know, I have a bit of experience with this one and my friend um, has got a similar one because he thought this was impressive. It's obviously a deep freeze, right? So we've got our deep freezer and you can even see that it's working and I've got it hooked up to the boat's 220 volts. But what's also really special about it is that it's got its own battery. So if you wanted to, you can hook it up to, you know, the, the engine battery or the genset battery and just run it off one of those. Uh, but at the moment, I'm running it off the inverter and that works great. So it's nice to always have that redundancy in the backup. And obviously, we've got the forward cabin here. And I explained about the benefit of the forward cabin. Loads of storage space. We've got our own air handling unit. And we have the windows closed because we're in the tropics at the moment. But yeah, it's, it's obviously a queen size berth. Um, so a couple can be in here or whoever you want to have as guests. So day head, good standing uh, headroom here. I'm six foot, so good standing red headroom. Got a good bit above me. And obviously, you know, I'm going to close the door. Got the, the head the, or the toilet behind me, electric flush toilet. And we got, you know, pretty good um, shower. 
this is just like any master cabin in a monohull boat. Uh, so remember, this is just a day head. And you've obviously got the toilet and then stowage behind. And there's loads of heaps of stowage in here. Got equipment and, you know, you know, wine and uh, you could even you could even store um, you know a small child in that cabin if you wanted to. One of the really good things about the Neil 51 is that you can close off the section of each hull. So let's remember it's like four owners hull on a mono hull inside and then you have a skipper cabin outside and a crew cabin in the forepeak. So that's a six cabin boat. So you're basically looking at nearly if you wanted to have a crew in charge of this boat, you have two crew, skipper and maybe hostess, um, and then you have your four VIPs inside. Quite incredible, particularly for a charter boat. As we sail along, we have a lot of people asking us, can we charter it, you know, what price is it to charter, or also asking to buy the boat. So you can get that separate, it's, it's sectioned off. You walk down and remember, it's quite nice for an offshore boat not to have this space too wide when you're walking up and down because if you fall, I'm not falling too far and when I do it, which is not if, but when I fall somewhere, I've got something soft to, to hit into. This nice and soft and cushions me. So no, no sharp corners when you come down steps. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's smart. Uh, anybody that um, I think doesn't doesn't see that is probably not much of an offshore sailor and remember this is an upwind sailing boat so you know you will be going into big waves and we have done as I'm sure you've seen in the videos before so this is the the lion's share of an owner's hull here um, you know this is the port side hull right so you've got your wet your wet toilet you've got your shower and generally you're going to use your shower in conjunction when you use the bathroom you're going to use the shower as well we don't generally like having toilet paper on board. Electric toilets, fresh water flush. So you've got loads of space here and I've just got this to keep the tropical sun out, but you've got your typical screens and you know, your typical hatch to cool off. So this is actually one of my favorite cabins, particularly when I was sailing on my own. I, I actually love this cabin because, I'm gonna jump on it. Probably should have got Eva to do this because you'll be more interested. But you know, you can jump in from the side and I think, um, you know you can jump in from the side but that whole area you can see as we kind of done here you can put pillows here and what it means is when you're when you're sleeping on passage you can sleep at any angle you want so no matter what way the waves are coming at you you can kind of have your feet to the waves that's a great advantage and if you look at that that's a queen size berth the red sheets that are on the bed at the moment so you have another single berth so that is effectively bigger than a super king bed on a boat that costs you a fraction of the price of what it would take to have a, have a super king size bed on any other boat. You might want to think about that one when you're looking around other boats. I think that's particularly impressive. We've got the electric fan um, and at the moment I've got this this covered up as an escape hatch. You know it's an escape hatch. Some people quite like watching the water rush by there. Escape hatch and you'll you'll no doubt see there's a little bit of fouling on the hulls. But there's something quite beautiful about, particularly on the trimaran. Whenever you're, when this, this is the windward hull, you'll be on passage and the, the hull will lift a little bit. So actually what happens is this hull, if it's the windward side, won't be in the water. And all it takes is for six knots of wind to do that. You know, it lifts at six knots of wind. So it's actually quite a nice feeling. You're actually sailing, but you're not in the water and there's a little bit of a lift and so you can get watch the the world go by as you're sitting here i think that's a wonderful design it just reminds you sometimes at sea you just want to get a bit of space and get away from others and get a bit of personal space um, and it's just nice to watch the world go by and read your book or whatever um, particularly so this you could argue this is equally a master cabin again on the the starboard side hull you have pretty much the same setup as you have in the port side hull but a little bit of a difference you still have, you know, the, the vanity units and the stuff you'd expect from an owner's cabin. You have, you know, the, the wet shower and, and toilet. And let's remember, you know, the wet rooms on boats is actually a preference because, you know, you, you basically, for sanitary reasons, you're going to be using water more than you're going to be using paper. So that's the way I'd put that one. And then obviously this is, Eva uses this room more herself, really, let, let's say like a dressing room or whatever. But you have, you know, same, same principles, you know, you watch the world go by 
Um, it's just wonderful, basically. Fly, flying a hull and looking out this window or just having a snooze or whatever is quite incredible. If I had kids on board, I'd probably put this as the kids' room. And although if you just pan across, you've still got your queen size berth. But in the corner here, you have another, it's essentially another possibility for putting a little mattress around the corner. And if I take the camera off Eva, I'm just going to show you that you can, if I'm looking down the bed here, Eva's using it quite a lot for storage, but it goes all the way back there. And that would be enough for like a, a you know, you could make up a mattress or something there. So yeah, probably this would end, but end up if you had a large family, which I think this boat's really geared towards, you know, uh, large families. Uh, you, you could set up another bed there and um, or, you know, if you could put a cot in there as well and have, you know, this is either mum mum or a child mind is, is here with with the child or whatever. So interesting point. But, yeah, I think it's it's underrated how, you know, if you if, you, if everything works out as planned and you're in smooth seas, lifting and flying a hull here and sleeping is quite wonderful. If you're just recently married or let's just say you're practicing you may want to think about how much bed space you have above the bed. Uh, it also helps when you don't bang your head when you wake up in the morning. And I think a lot of boats get that wrong. They make the, they, they focus your attention on the, on the size of the bed or the width of it, but they don't, they don't like to talk about, you know, the headroom above the bed. And so when you sit up and you get up, it's nice. It's quite nice actually to have that extra space. It's also very nice having the master cabin so close to the nav station. So, you know, if you wake up and you're just kind of a bit edgy, you can go and check things up, or if you need to wake up quickly and run and check up the, the nav station or get to the radio and that sort of, sort of stuff as well. As my friend says, you know you're winning when you wake up and you look outside and you see the view. At the moment, we've got the sunscreens on in the tropics, but when we're under anchor and we have the sunscreens off for navigating, it's an amazing feeling, just wonderful to look out. And you can stay in an anchorage for five days and have a different view every morning because the boat's moving under anchor. And so don't underestimate that, that large window. It's like a big flat screen TV. And having your port light there to get a bit of ventilation coming in is, is, is also nice. Great to having the air con as well in the tropics. What I've added also, we've obviously got all the stowage as well, but I've added this, this um, little bidet. It's quite nicely hidden as you can see. And I think pretty much everybody should, should add one of those in a boat. It's a mechanical bidet, so there's no electrical parts. So less to break down, just works off water pressure. And it saves you, you know, it's obviously more hygienic and it just saves you having to, you know, source and um, also use toilet paper. Uh, so I highly suggest if you live in a sailboat or you're looking to buy one, get one of those little uh, $30, $30 mechanical B days. Job done. Obviously we've got a shower here as well and it's a full standing shower. It's the biggest shower on the boat. So thank you very much for watching uh, yet again. I hope, you know, maybe even if you're not interested in buying this particular boat, that you know you might have learned something which will be useful and you know increase your safety or your knowledge uh, for sailing or being at sea. I think myself and Eva are pretty tired from all the polishing. That's one thing I've mentioned in my live stream. You know it's very very tiring polishing a large boat like this. Um, and so again, you could just think about doing decals. But anyway, we have it in in, in excellent shape at the moment. And on top of that, what I've decided to do was to spend a bit of money actually on on making sure like things like I've replaced the injectors. A lot of people would say, God, you know, that's a, a little bit of a waste of money. In my view, it's not. I want to make sure that I get all the maximum power and, and everything's like new. And in that regard, I basically completely rebuilt the generator as well. Um, there's very good skill set here. So basically what you're getting, in, if you're interested in buying Carry On, is, you know, a battle-tested ship, which has basically been completely refitted and refurbished, in, you know, from the mechanical aspect. Uh, very stable. And you don't have to wait out. And, and I think with the Neil Shipyard at the moment, it's nearly a three-year waiting list for on on the on the new boats. So, uh, yeah, just get sailing, get get sailing now. And um, if you're interested, you can catch us at sailingcarryon at gmail.com. And uh, if you give us an email, uh, we'll be able to reply back to you. Thanks a lot. See you next time.